Hi, and welcome back to the second hour of this Monday edition of Focal Point on AFR Talk. And I, I, I just want to be sure that I'm not misunderstood to kind of close the loop on our discussion in the last segment. I, I, I'm not out to blame anybody. I don't want to make anybody feel guilty that has no reason uh, to feel guilty uh, because divorce happens and to a lot of people and they there's nothing they can do about it. They, they can't control the outcome of that because you're dealing with two people, each of whom has an independent free will and people can wind up divorced even though they've done everything in their power to keep that marriage, to keep that family, to keep that little miniature civilization uh, together. And I just, my just heart breaks for those people that, that want to keep this thing together for the sake of the marriage, for the sake of the vow that they made to God, for the sake of their children. And they're not allowed to because our divorce laws allow somebody to escape the marriage commitment without just cause. You can get out of a marriage commitment now easier than you get out of a car lease. And your partner doesn't even have to be at fault for anything. You can just go in and say, I just can't get along with them anymore. And the judge is sort of obligated legally to to stamp uh, dissolution of divorce on on the papers. You know, uh, most every state uh, has... I, I don't know if generous is the right word, but there are a, there's a number of things that constitute grounds for divorce. I know in, in Idaho and my home, and it's more expansive even than biblical grounds. You know, in the scripture, the biblical grounds for divorce is uh, sexual infidelity. Now, there's no reason that a woman biblically has to put up with physical abuse, for instance, because that's where church discipline comes into play. You know, if there's physical abuse involved, the church can get involved, the leaders can get involved, and there can be an intervention so that a woman has protection from that. So we're not talking about a woman staying in there and just getting beaten up. That's not what we're talking about. But, you know, in Idaho, I know that um, prolonged mental illness was a basis, substance abuse, uh, cruelty, uh, physical abuse, desertion, adultery. There were seven, eight, or nine reasons, all of which represented fundamental violations of the marriage covenant. And if that could be demonstrated in a court of law, then you were allowed to dissolve uh, the marriage. Uh, and so, so we're not saying the no divorce for any reasons whatsoever. I'm not talking about that, but you know, my, just, my heart just breaks for guys like Josh. I mean, you'd hear it in his voice. He loves his son. He wants to be involved with his son. And now due to circumstances and a sort of an, an imbalanced court system, he, he can't do that. He, he's prevented from doing that. And I, you know, I just, it just, it just breaks my heart. And I think one of the ways to, to, to sort of bring us back to balance is, is to get rid of no fault divorce you know, and go back to a fault-based system of granting divorce because we just have to understand the terrible, terrible impact on not only children but also on adults. I mean, adults get get chewed up by this. I mean, I've seen it, you know, where, uh, say, a, a, a husband of, is divorced by his wife because she hooks up with somebody else, and it's completely devastating to him. It comes out of the blue. He has no idea. It just winds up completely shattering him, his sense of himself, his sense of masculinity. Uh, it takes years to rebound and years to recover uh, from that. And, and children suffer tremendous pain. And so I think if we're, if we're going to, you know, and, and there are times when it's inevitable. Even Jesus said, look, there is a basis even for my disciples to initiate divorce. But we need to understand the terrible, terrible, terrible human cost of divorce. And we need to raise the bar. We need to raise the guardrails. Uh, so that uh, people understand that as a culture, when you make a commitment to get married, we're, we're going to take that commitment very, very seriously. We're going to hold you to your promise, and we're only going to allow you to terminate this covenant relationship if your partner has violated the terms of the covenant. We're not going to we're not going to let you terminate this thing and break up this family just because you found somebody else. That's not going to be sufficient grounds. Uh, to destroy this little civilization, do the damage it does to spouses and to children. All right, let's go back to the phones. Uh, 888-589-8840 is the number. Let's begin with Ed in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Ed, welcome. What's on your mind? Hey, how you doing, Mr. Fisher? I'm doing good. How are you? I want to say Merry Christmas to everyone. Well, and Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. Um, the reason for me calling today is I have gotten to several discussions uh, heated discussions over Christianity and liberalism. And uh, speaking of uh, telling me that a person can be a Christian and liberal at the same time, 
and the only thing that I could come up with was, you know, uh, what what the Lord says in the Bible with um, uh, marriage, um, man and man and woman and woman, and about abortions. And if they're listening today, so if you could please help me out with this um, to better uh, discuss this. Now, what what are the the specific issues that you're you're talking about again? I want to be sure I understand exactly what you're looking for. Um, here. About homosexuality, uh-huh. uh, same-sex marriage, and abortion. Okay. And um, they're telling me that when I bring that up, they're telling me that they can be a Christian and liberal at the same time, and I'm having a hard time trying to believe that because I don't think that can happen. But well, you know, and the, um, and the reality is, you know, you you cannot. You know, and again, some of it comes down to the definition of Christian. But, you know, my understanding, I think most everybody's understanding is a devoted follower of Jesus would be the definition of a Christian, somebody who follows him and looks to him as his God and as his mentor and as his teacher and as his role model and as his instructor. That, to me, is a Christian, somebody who follows uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, well, you cannot, you know, and, and Ed, I think you got to realize some of these people, they're, they're just no way you're going to be able to reason with them. You're just not going to be able to do it. I've you know, noticed that. <laughs> as, you know, and that's part of the frustration that we have is, and I'm, I'm going to get to a little bit of that here in a second, but part of the frustration we have is, you know, we believe in rationality. We believe in logic. We believe in discussion. We believe in making a case. We believe in backing it up with evidence and with logic and with research and with history. We believe in all that. But, Ed, you got to understand the left doesn't believe in any of that. That They don't believe in any of that. They are. It's an entirely an emotional-based worldview. It's driven by emotion. It's entirely subjective. Uh, they want same-sex marriage because, because they want it, because they feel like it's mean not to be for it. They don't have a basis for saying that, uh, but it's entirely subjective, entirely emotional. So... I think the reality is, uh, you know, a lot of what I do here on this program is cultural apologetics. And I realize I'm not probably going to convince very many liberals, but my purpose, Ed, is to to strengthen the convictions of those that listen to this program and share our ideals to realize, no, you know, there is a good sound basis. There is a good sound basis for what we believe. Now, let me give you two quick examples because we're about out of time. When it comes to homosexuality, uh, a simple basis to say that homosexuality should not be encouraged, promoted is because of all of the health risks that are involved in homosexual behavior. And you can go to the Centers for Disease Control, and you can see all of the health risks that are involved in homosexual behavior. It's the number one risk factor for HIV AIDS, for instance. So we say, no, just look at the research, look at the medical research. This is not a lifestyle we ought to be promoting. It's the number one risk factor for HIV AIDS. The number two risk risk factor is intravenous drug abuse. So it's a lifestyle that's as dangerous Excuse me, the human health is IV drug abuse. It's not something we ought to be promoting. When it comes to abortion, medical science, every medical science, geneticists, medical professional will tell you, Ed, that life begins at conception. That is a scientific, genetic, biological fact. Human life begins at conception. And therefore, according to the founders, that human life is worthy of legal protection. Local Point, AFR Talk. We'll be back. Stay with us.